Hey folks, I want to talk about Bohemian Rhapsody. Not the movie, haven't seen it yet. We'll see it. I know the reviews are a little equivocal, but as many people have pointed out, if the critics are sneering but the fans love it, that's entirely appropriate for a movie about Queen because that's always the way it was for Queen. No, I want to talk about the song Bohemian Rhapsody. And in particular, I want to give you six reasons why Bohemian Rhapsody is an even better song than you think it is. Number one. It's six minutes long. Now, the amazing thing about Bohemian Rhapsody is not that it's six minutes long. The amazing thing about Bohemian Rhapsody is that it is only six minutes long. It gets so much done in those six minutes. There's more ideas, there's more artistry, there's more musical experimentation crammed into this one record than most bands, even in the prog era, would get into an entire album. There's more experimentation than most bands since the prog era and get into their entire career. Number two, the guitar solo. I've always been a big fan of Brian May just because he's such a massive nerd. I mean, he built his own guitar out of bicycle parts and knitting needles. He managed to have a dorky bubble perm at a time, but it's perfectly acceptable for white guys to have massive bubble perms. But also because he has a slightly different attitude to lead guitar than most lead guitarists do. Brian May will actually go away and sometimes compose his guitar solo on a keyboard as a melody in its own right, and then come back and try and figure it out on the guitar. Because as he once pointed out, if you just start playing, then your fingers tend to do the same things, where it's better if you go away and actually compose a proper melody and then try and transpose it onto the guitar. And Bohemian Rhapsody is the classic example of this. And it's an essential part of the song. Song just wouldn't work without it. Number three, it's not afraid to be silly. Now, in 1975, there was no Google Translate. There was no Google. There was no internet. But even back then, it wouldn't have been impossible to round up somebody who spoke a bit of Italian to write a cod Italian libretto for the operatic section that actually means something. But the fact that Freddie chooses to go with just nonsense bits of Italian and Spanish that sound good. Now, I've often wondered if Galileo was thrown in as a sop to Brian's obsession with astronomy. Scaramouche, Scaramouche, will you do the Fandango? That means literally nothing. No, it works perfectly. But it's almost Freddie winking at the camera, isn't it? In the middle of all this artistry, in the middle of all this experimentation, it's almost like he turns to the audience and says, don't worry, darling, just, just a bit of fun. Number four, it brought prog to the masses. The thing about Bohemian Rhapsody is you have to take it in context. Now, in 1975, it was not the only bit of music that sounded like that. There was a lot of rock music that had movements. There was a lot of rock music that would devote entire sections just to virtuoso guitar playing or virtuoso keyboard playing. There was a lot of rock music that threaded different sections together. But where this wasn't happening was on top of the pops. It was not happening on Radio 1. It was not happening at number one in the singles chart. What Bohemian Rhapsody does is it takes the artistry and the experimentation and the virtuosity of prog and condenses it into an immediately accessible, unusually long, but still seven inch pop single that gets on the radio and that sells millions and gets on the telly. So they weren't the only people experimenting in rock and roll, but they were the only people doing it in such an accessible way. Number five, the fact that it works at all. I write songs for a living, but I also, as a musical parodist, I deconstruct songs for a living. Now, Bohemian Rhapsody is a musical masterpiece, but it's a structural miracle. It starts off almost as a kind of gospel spiritual, slides effortlessly into a kind of Elton John-esque piano ballad that then cranks up into a kind of proto-1980s power ballad for the guitar solo section that then segues perfectly into the Cod Italian opera bit that then builds up into the headbanging section, which then goes into reprise of the piano ballad, which then goes into the outro, which kind of back references the gospelish intro. And it's only six minutes long, and each bit leads perfectly organically into the next bit. It shouldn't work. It should be a total mess, and it should be at least 20 minutes long. It's not. It works perfectly, and it's in and out in six minutes. It's amazing. Number six, the video. Back then, in the mid-70s, in Britain anyway, if you wanted to have a hit record, at some point you're going to have to turn up a Top of the Pops and stand on a box and pretend to play it. It's very weird looking back at the old Top of the Pops now as they're being repeated on BBC4 because the whole thing is this weird exercise in suspension of disbelief. The crowd know the acts aren't really playing. The acts know they're not really playing. And I'm fairly certain that the audiences at home knew that the acts weren't really playing. They're standing there and flapping their gobs open and closed while the record plays. And yet that was how you had it record in the mid-1970s, whoever you were. But of course, with the best will in the world, the four of them couldn't stand there and pretend to be this invisible choral society that does the operatic section. 
So it was necessary to come up with a video, and in particular a video with a kind of weird expressionistic bit in the middle to kind of provide some kind of visual counterpoint to a bit that the band could never actually play. And they shot it in one day, a couple of cheap video effects, a couple of spotlights, a couple of backcloths, and then that, you know, little stage set where they play the rock sections. And considering the industry that this video spawned, which within six or seven years, every video had to cost like half a million dollars. It's incredibly cheap and basic, but here's the thing. It looks exactly how the song sounds to the point where even after Wayne's World, it's very difficult to have any other visual image in your head while listening to that song other than that which the video provided. So there you go. Uh, I am going to see the movie quite soon and uh, maybe I'll review it when I do. Thanks for listening. This video was made possible by the supporters of my Patreon project, who helped me make fun things while receiving great perks and rewards. If you enjoyed it, why not follow the link and join us?